Can everybody hear me? We're going to start in here pretty soon. So everybody can hear me back in the peanut gallery, way back there. <laughs> well, it's nice to see another big crowd here because I think we have a really great program today. Uh, to begin with, uh, we have a Mary Elfman who's with, with the Veteran Service. She's Veteran Service Officer is uh, going to say something about the Alexander Memorial program they have going. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Good. My voice tends to carry. The Army taught me that. Um, so I'm here as the County Veteran Service Officer and as a co-chair of the Committee for the Restoration of the Alexander Memorial. Now, I know Danielle was here a few months back, gave you a short little talk about it. Uh, we've been moving forward. It's exciting. Uh, we actually have a community foundation account established now uh, for uh, donations, both by check and online. I have flyers for you here in case you're interested. Uh, one of the fundraising uh, items that we have is the Monroe County Bicentennial Coloring Book. It is historical and or notable locations around Monroe County. Uh, all of the artwork in here were, was done by 26 local artists, 21 of them, excuse me, 20 of them which were high school students from Bloomington South High School. Um, it's a wonderful coloring book. Um, and I'll be selling them after your meeting back here in this very dark corner of the dining room. How much? How much the question is? $15 each. 100% of the proceeds goes back into the fund. Okay? That is, of course, after we pay sales tax to the state of Indiana. We're also selling commemorative coins that uh, have the Alexander, the Civil War soldier who's atop the memorial on one side and the courthouse dome on the other side these are ten dollars each back there in the corner very dark but i'll be there <laughs> i appreciate you allowing me to give you my commercial before you start your wonderful meeting today thank you very much please support our project thanks mary uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my wife Paulette's here today, as usual. My mother Mary Carter and the various cousins back there. So it's a family affair, sort of. Uh, oh. oh no. Yeah, it's your, it's your turn. <laughs> our, our minister of propaganda is George, so he has a few words. He always says words. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, welcome all. How many of you had lunch here today? <laughs> Our servers were Shirley and Misty and Julie. Please be generous with them as you can. They're, they're absolutely wonderful. Julie so and, and Carrie. Here's Carrie. <laughs> I'm just carrying a train. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, folks. We really appreciate it. Once again, thanks to Cats. Uh, got some good news about Cats. Uh, we suggested to their manager that they come sometime and make a presentation about what they do. And you have an enormous asset in this community with, the, with, the, with cats. And I'm really glad to hear that they accepted our invitation. Uh, I'd like to thank the Legion once again for their cooperation. Uh, and somebody's going to ask a question. Who's going to ask a question? That guy's going to ask a question. He's not raising his hand to ask a question. Oh, I got I'm controlling the camera. <laughs> uh, as Mike Carter I uh, introduces his wife, this is my wife, Mary Ann Carpenter. Uh, she's from Texas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's such a joy to have you all here. Thank you very much. Those of you who are not on our mailing list, our email mailing list, and would like to be, please seed me with your name and email address, and I'll see to it that you put on this. One more thing, Steve Jobs used to say. 
How many of you have looked at our product on, on YouTube? Yeah, did you subscribe? Be sure to subscribe, that way you know when something new comes on without being told. Yeah. Any problems with the email or announcements, let me know, that's what I do. Thank you very much, have a good day. Thank you. Yeah, he gets applause. Great. Um, I'll go through some of our future programs here because we have a lot of them we're booked through next January. Uh, June 26th this year, uh, local renowned sports writer, uh, Retired sports writer Bob Hamill will give a presentation on the Monroe County Sports Hall of Fame and its newest inductees, which I think they've just, just named. July 31st, Brad Cook of IU Photo Archives Department will return to give part three of his pictorial history of IU. Uh, he's all the way up to 1930, so that's where he'll start with this. Uh, August 28th, local historian David Nord will give a presentation on the history of Springville State Park in words and pictures. I saw him give this down, down at the state park, and it's very good. People will like it. Uh, September 25th, just like George mentioned, uh, Michael White of local Cats TV, who records all of our events, will give a program over the 40-year history of that organization. October 30th, Carrie Beam, director of the Wiley House, will give a detailed program on the Wiley House and what an important place it occupies in our local history. November 27th, uh, Monroe County History Center uh, Director Susan Dyer will give a program focusing uh, on the role RCA played in war production only. It's going to focus on the war production. Uh, that'll be brought up a little bit here today, too, but uh, that's for uh, November. December 18th, local author and historian uh, Derek Ritchie will return to show more old photos from the 1960s scanned from the archives of Bloomington Herald Telephone. People always like these a lot. We've done this like four times. And January 8th, 2000, or January 29th, 2019, IU history professor emeritus Jim Madison will give a program tentatively on the bicentennial of Monroe County. So that's some pretty good programs. So that brings us to, to today. Uh, we have Mr. Gib Apple, former plant manager of our RC, RCA plant here in Bloomington. And hardly anybody knows more about it than Gib. And he's got some interesting stuff to say. In his words, he will start with a very brief history of RCA from its inception in 1919 to 1939. Uh, his RCA Bloomington story starts in February 1940 and ends with the November 2015 proclamation from Mayor Cruzan and a donation of RCA memorabilia to Monroe County History Center. Uh, in addition, uh, a lot of people brought some stuff to share, to look at, which is on the table right over here. A lot of interesting things you might want to glance at as you get a chance after the meeting. <laughs> and so uh, without further ado, here's Gib. Thank you, Mike. Everybody hear me? If you can't hear me, hold up your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, everyone before me has started by introducing their wife. I'm going to introduce my wife also, Sandy, and Sandy is in the program. If the pictures that we try to put up on the screen happen to match what I'm saying, then she will have done a good job. <laughs> Un unfortunately, we have more words than we do pictures, so she can't always be up with me. Uh, I, I want to give uh, thanks to uh, the Clay Stuckey who put our f picture program together, and uh, we worked uh, for a few hours getting that uh, in the order that we thought was right. We all want to thank Michael Carter because Michael played a big part in his efforts to obtain many of the pictures, and thanks to many of you who probably sent in the pictures so that we could get to George and he put the program together. Uh, I, unfortunately, I'm going to have to read a good amount of my presentation uh, because it's pretty difficult. I'm going to start with 1919 and I'm going all the way to, uh, pardon? Oh, I thought there was a problem there. No, sir. 
more light on the deck on the podium. Does it work? Yeah, let's take it. Uh, That's just fine. It did work. I'm, I'm, I'm real good at destroying things. <laughs> uh, the, I've got enough light, so that, that'll that be okay. Anyway, uh, it's just too much to try to remember 99 years worth of RCA uh, information, so, so I, I can't do it, so I'm going to read a good amount. Some of the information I'm going to share with you is staggering in the numbers, but I guarantee you they're accurate. Uh, and, and I guess I would like to last say before I start through it, I'm very proud to have been chosen as one of the plant managers at RCA. I was the 10th plant manager, and it's a, just a tremendous privilege, and I enjoyed it considerably, and uh, it would have been good if uh, I hadn't had to retire. But uh, I'm also very proud of all of the people who worked at RCA to make our product what it was and as good as it was and to, to get the recognition that RCA achieved. So uh, with that, uh, I guess uh, uh, if you have any questions, please hold them because uh, we're going to have questions at the end of the uh, presentation and possibly I'll answer at least one or two of your questions along the way. Are you ready, dear? <laughs> She's ready. <laughs> In 1919, Radio Corporation of America was formed. The birth of RCA had nothing to do with radio broadcasting or sales. It was formed at the urging of the U.S. Navy to assure that the U.S. had a, a company that would exist in her, to handle international communications in the case of a national emergency. And GE was the first major shareholder. In 1922, RCA moved into consumer electronics by introducing a product called Radiola One, which was a crystal radio with headphones that you listen to. In 1926, RCA established the National Broadcasting Company, NBC. In 1929, RCA acquired the Victor Talking Machine Company and its popular mascot, Nipper who is a terrier depicted listening to his master's voice, as we see here. 1929, RCA acquired the Westinghouse factory in Indianapolis to make radio tubes. In 1932, the U.S. government decreed that RCA should be separated from GE, and my wish is they had never got back together again. <laughs> In 1939, the president of RCA, David Sarnoff, gave a public demonstration of television in the RCA pavilion at the New York World's Fair. And uh, I'm a little louder. Yeah, I'm talking a little louder. Talk a little louder. Is that better? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll try. I'm going to start today, this afternoon, with RCA before Bloomington, which we've just covered. How's that? Yeah. But then you can't read if you're looking down. Yeah, well, I'll... I appreciate, I truly appreciate the help. <laughs> I've had a lot of help from ladies. <laughs> Before I get started totally into this, hopefully, I'd, I'd like for all of the audience members that worked at RCA to raise their hand. I think there's about 30, and that's pretty darn good. Now, also, if you if a family member is here and they worked at RCA, raise your hand. Oh, we have a few family members. That's excellent. Thank you all. The information in this story comes from many sources: RCA newsletters, 
Indiana Business Magazines, RCA Information Documents, RCA Engineer Magazine, the Monroe County Timeline, the Herald Times Newspaper, an early historical event document by Judy Houston, who was one of our longtime employees, and the saving of many company uh, documents by Jeanette Silvers, another long-term employee, uh, from uh, also some from the internet and some from my personal experiences. Here we go. On August 4th, 1939, Two gentlemen visited the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce asking questions about Bloomington and said they were just looking around as their company might want to start a new plant in Indiana, Illinois, or Ohio. They declined to give their names or the name of their company. Their questions were answered and they left. About two weeks later, uh, the men returned to Bloomington identified themselves as Robert Shannon and Ted Walks, I'm sure you all know those folks, of Radio Corporation of America. They asked for more detailed information and spent several hours at the Chamber of Commerce office. Upon leaving, they said, forget we were here. Most likely nothing will happen. The mayor, Loba Jack Bruner, and the city fathers didn't forget. Uh, they and an industrial committee developed a proposal that was accepted by RCA. What a lifesaver this was to the Bloomington community, as the city and the county were just uh, coming out of the Depression, uh, which had been also had been a big business boom of only limestone-type industries in Bloomington and the Monroe County area. On February 22nd of 1940, RCA purchased the building at 13 excuse me, 1300 South Rogers Street in Bloomington. And uh, I think we're gonna have a picture of that when a button gets pushed. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're not certain exactly which year this picture is. It may have been a little before 1940 or a little after or just right on the button. But this is a, the, pic, the plant did look like this and I'm sure some of you might remember that. <laughs> when the plant was first started by GE, a large stone sign was put above the entrance, which would have been about the middle of the picture, about the middle of the picture there. And the sign uh, said, uh, RCA Manufacturing Company Incorporated on the first line and Bloomington Works on the second line. And this building became known forever as Plant One. Uh, during demolition of the building, 75 years later, which was just in 2015, the sign was discovered. It had been hidden and forgotten by renovations to the building. The sign is now in the hands of the Bloomington Parks Department for safekeeping and possible location in a new city park, which might be the Switchyard Park. Uh, in June of 1940, 11 men arrived in Bloomington to officially begin operations at the newest RCA plant. Uh, one, uh, one, on June, 9th, June 17, 1940, the first RCA Victor table model radio rolled off the assembly line. This model was named Nipper after the famous RCA canine mascot, which we've got up again. Uh, in the beginning, only single females with a high school 16 years old and with a high school diploma were uh, offered jobs. Uh, as only single females could uh, work at the plant, many did what others are still doing today. They fibbed about their age. <laughs> <laughs> females were preferred as they were thought to be more receptive to repetitive assembly line work and their smaller hands were better suited to pick up and placement of the small parts that went into making radios. About 75% of the first employees were ladies. Males were assigned to assembly tasks that had heavy components and heavy lifting requirements. By, night, by August of 1940, there were four assembly lines producing nipper table model radios. 
an open house was held to show the folks at home what their sons and daughters were doing. And about 1,500 uh, parents and other friends visited during that open house. By the end of 1940, 300,000 radios had been produced and three new models, small personal radios, console radios, and auto radios had been added. On September 5th of 1941, the plant achieved a production record when the one millionth Nipper radio was produced. On December 8, 1941, the factory wheels hummed with victory tunes as the plant changed to war production as a result of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. In early 1942, the first war contract was received from the Army Signal Corps for tank transmitters and receivers to support the U.S. and its allies. In September of 1942, work began on a secret project for the U.S. Navy called Madam X. The nature of the project was not disclosed until after BJ Day, Victory Over Japan Day. The Bloomington plant was the first of five RCA plants to produce this item. A special room known as the secret room was selected to assemble this item. Employees working in the secret room were required to sign an oath of secrecy document for the U.S. government stipulating they would not discuss their work outside of this room. The oath of secrecy was forever. The, what you see on the screen now is a copy of uh, Dick Mitchell, who is here today. His mother uh, had to leave work early due to, to, had to quit at RCA due to a health problem in the family. When she left work, she was required to sign this document, which you can see her name, Carrie Mitchell. And she said, it has been explained to me that this is sick, secret forever. You know, so and I know, happen to know what the Madam X was, and I am not sharing it. <laughs> they might be after me. <clears throat> I think uh, Bob Hannum, who's here today, and Michael Carter, and many others who are here today might have had parents working in the signal uh, secret room. If any of your parents worked in the sink, or family members worked in the secret room, please raise your hand. We've got, we've got five, five or six. Okay, that's pretty good. 1943 and 1944 were much the same as 1942 with war support production. Uh, employees with, uh, were busy with consistent output. There were many bought U.S. war bonds working many hours to achieve the needs of the U.S. military. In August of 45, peace was achieved. War production came to an abrupt halt. Nearly all employees were placed on a lack of work status as the plant reverted back to peacetime work. On September 21st of 1945, the Madam X technology was described as second only to the atomic bomb. This project's cost was staggering. $800 million back in 1945. In recognition of its work on this secret weapon, the plant was awarded a special Navy flag with three stars. For their work to support our country and our troops, the ladies at Bloomington were recognized as Roses of Indiana in an article written on September 7, 2018 by Elizabeth Collier of the World War II Museum. And I think we're going to have something coming up here. Uh, that's a part of the uh, document, uh, and uh, some of our Rosie's working, a picture of uh, operators on the assembly line. Uh, just five weeks after the end of the war, uh, well, I didn't quite finish that. Uh, there were women who replaced men in the workforce during the war because the men were in the military. Just five weeks after the end of wartime work, eight new radio models were designed as the kickoff line. One of those uh, models happened to be the 68RS radio. And in happenstance, in 1990, my wife and I were on a driving vacation. We like to just drive. 
and we were in upstate New York. My wife saw a yard sale, and of course we stopped. I, I asked the lady running the sale if they had any RCA items. She pointed to the back and said, we have an old radio back there. And uh, I bought that old radio because I was buying whatever RCA memorabilia that was reasonable, and I had to pay $5 for this. <laughs> and, and there is the radio on the... And uh, then a few days after we got home with our radio, I walked into one of the manager's offices who worked for me, and he had a picture of my radio on his wall. And that's this picture on the right here, my right. And this was a page out of a Life magazine article, uh, advertisement, if you will, for the uh, RCA radio. And uh, we're pleased to have both of those items as part of our memorabilia. In early 1946, all auto radio assembly was moved to the Chicago RCA plant in, in anticipation that production of console and table model radios and record changers would dramatically increase, and they did. Do we have a picture on that, dear? There it is. That's a record changer, one of the models. Uh, that, that also happens to be one of our memorabilia items, and today it looks just as new as it ever looked. And when we first opened it, there was a record laying in there, kind of skewed in on top of it. And we put the record on and turned it on, and it played. And uh, I have no idea exactly how old that is. I could probably take it apart and there'd be a, a tag on it somewhere, but I elected not to do that. Uh, it, in, by November of 1946, it was planned that RCA would have two black and white television receivers on the market. One was to be a table model with a screen size of a shot big six inches by eight inches. <laughs> and a price tag of only $350. The other was also a table model, which uh, had a little larger screen, uh, but it was uh, only a little over $350. It cannot be confirmed that either of these models uh, ever made it to the market as planned. On December 14th of 1946, the one millionth art radio since Victory Age over Japan Day was produced. The numbers continue to get bigger. In August of 1948, at the Monroe County Fair in the RCA booth, the wonder of television was shown to hundreds of people. Television receivers were set up with cameras rolling. People watched themselves on television, and the new miracles of television were launched in Bloomington. In September of 1948, Sarkis Tarjan, the former RCA chief engineer and one of the 11 men coming to Bloomington back in 1940, built and started the first local TV station. There were local programs and programs from the Crosby Broadcasting Company in Cincinnati, Ohio. At this time, Indianapolis did not have a television station. In 1948, the RCA Berkshire series was top of the line black and white TV. The Regency model cost $3,250 in, in 1948. For your $3,250, you received RCA's best TV system with a big 15 inch by 20 inch screen, a chrome plated AM FM seven band shortwave radio with auto tune, a chrome plated AM FM uh, I've said that. A phonograph changer with the latest GE magnetic pickup, a chrome-plated 40-watt amplifier, and a 15-inch speaker. All of this was located in a massive cabinet, 53 inches high by 6 feet wide by 24 inches deep, weighing only 545 pounds. <laughs> what a deal. <laughs> on, se on September... Uh, Oh, uh, 246 of these units were produced. I have no idea how many were sold or how many were given away. <laughs> in the early 19, uh, in, on, on September 6th of 1949, Bloomington entered the magic realm of television on a totally realistic basis with complete assembly of black and white sets with 12 and a half inch screens. 
including all manufacturing of required subassemblies. We were building tuners, printed circuit boards, and putting them together in the chassis. We're off and running with another product that changed the world. In the early 1950s, the number of employees had significantly increased, which created major auto parking problems. Many parked on city streets, which created a, a parking problem for homeowners, as many homeowners did not have garages or driveways or alleys. The city started a program of selling on-street parking permits, which helped some. Many homeowners rented parking spaces, as I just said. This gave the homeowners some extra cash and benefited workers by guaranteeing a place to park. Homeowners didn't need their clocks to know when RCA <coughs> quit for the day. Car doors slamming, engines starting, and tires squealing signaled it was four o'clock. Four o'clock. Parking problems were not eliminated until 1966 with the opening of Plant 2 and its adjoining large parking lot. And this is, a, that's still Plant 1 picture, Plant 2, dear. <laughs> uh, we'll go right ahead. In June of 1950, at the 10th anniversary of the Bloomington plant and with the advent of the television assembly in Bloomington, General Sarnoff, the president of RCA, estimated that by the end of 1955, there would be 20 million TV sets in American homes. At the start of 1950, there were 1 million TV sets reportedly in New York City, and there were 98 television broadcasting stations in the United States. On July 6, 1951, the, work, the workers, we had 90 workers at the RCA Bloomington plant. In, Jul in later July of 1951, <coughs> Bloomington employees once again be began production of Madam X in support of the Korean War effort. Also, the plant continued to produce TV sets, radios, and record changers. And, there, and there are some of the radios, small screen radios, that we produced at that time. Also, General Sarnoff stated that America to be first in peace and first in war must be first in science. On August 27, 1952, it was announced that hundreds of workers have been added since June 1st and more are needed due to the demand for TV sets. 200 women are needed now for final TV assembly. Also, about 15 technicians and 10 cabinet touch-up touch -up operators were ne needed. On November 1, 1952, Madam X assembly work was moved to the RCA plant in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. All radio production was transferred, transferred to other RCA plants. The Bloomington plant was now totally committed to color, color television. In September of 1943, Plant 1 was ex expanded by 175,000 square feet to over 10 acres, 425,000 square feet under roof to support greatly increased black and white TV production and color TVs. A thousand or more new workers will be needed to support the planned production increase. On May 17, 1954, Color Television Assembly In January of 1954, RCA showed the public the first 15-inch screen-sized color television set, broadcasting the Rose Bowl Parade from Los Angeles, California, to Rockefeller Center. On May 17, 1954, color television assembly was introduced in Bloomington on a regular production schedule. The first set, CT100, which is not one of those, but that's a real... That's one of the first sets you're looking at. <clears throat> and this set was 15-inch tricolor picture tube, and the price of it was only $1,000. Prices were getting a little better. After months of intensive preparation, production of RCA color sets became a reality. Initial production was in small quantities that <coughs> steadily increased. This monumental first year, Bloomington manufactured 4,355 
color TV sets. It was announced in August of 55 that RCA is preparing for breaking TV production schedule and recording breaking employment due to an increased demand for color TV sets. Demand for high production of radios became a thing of the past. On December 13, 1955, construction of a new 120,000 square foot warehouse was announced. At a cost of three quarter million dollars, this facility will provide additional space for TV warehousing and shipping facilities to support ever increasing production of color and some black and white TVs. The warehouse was named Apple Hill as part of an apple orchard had to be removed to provide adequate space for the warehouse. It was not named after me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> By February 1st of 1956, the Bloomington plant leads the way in color TV manufacturing as it has increased from producing 10 sets per hour per line to producing 60 sets per hour per line. And that number will be a little larger as I go, go on. On June 17, 1956, RCA announced that it is increasing employees with 1,100 new job openings due to a more planned increase in color TV production. Just one year later, in June of 1957, another planned increase of 1,000 employees between June and August was announced to, again, support color TV sales production. On August 7th of 1957, the, work, the workforce was announced at 3,000 employees. In the early 1960s, black and white TV manufacturing was totally phased out. In August of 1965, it was announced that a second TV assembly plant was under construction at a cost of $5.9 million. This building will be named Plant 2 and will more than double, and that's a picture of, of one end of Plant 2 that you have there, will more than double the production volume and outgoing quality. The Bloomington RCA plant became known as the color television capital of the world. Signs leading in and out of Bloomington proclaimed it to be so. Plant 1 was in full use manufacturing and testing TV components, printed circuit boards and chassis. Peak employment of 8,000 employees occurred in 1966. In 1967, color TV sales exceeded $3 billion for the first time. It wasn't the last time, just the first time. On July 8, 1973, production needs again outpaced available workers. There were 6,700 employees at this time. 35% were from Monroe County. The balance were from surrounding communities, Bedford, Bloomfield, Linton, Lagodi, Martinville, Mitchell, Nashville, Paoli, Vincennes, Washington, and probably one or two that I failed to mention. Private, bu private bus lines were in service daily uh, to help address this need. About 70% of the workers at this time were ladies. Uh, all men, all were assigned, uh, all were not assigned to assembly work. Some were group leaders, some were very successful line supervisors, and some had moved into management very successfully. On November 22, 1977, the 30 millionth RCA color TV set was produced on line five. And it was a 25 inch color console, and we have the, the words there, but we don't have the picture. <laughs> we have a picture, however. In the late 1970s, the Interstate Commerce Commission deregulated deregu truck transportation and pricing controls. This action resulted in major cost reductions and more timely delivery of materials by trucks. It also created major traffic problems on Bloomington streets. With 150 to 200 trucks and trailers daily delivering materials to RCA, a number of the city streets just were not able to handle congestion. In some cases, the roads were too narrow. In other cases, some of the uh, overpasses were not large enough when overpass was over the railroads and the trucks couldn't even get through. 
it was obvious that a direct route through the city to RCA was needed. The city did not have funds for a new road at this time, and the best route for the road had not been determined. <coughs> and there'll be a little bit more on this later. In July of 1980, Bloomington was selected to assemble video disc players. The video disc player was an alternative to VCRs. Uh, and VCRs had an ever-increasing cost. The video disc player market prices were about $200 per item. The VCRs were about $400. National introduction of the RCA Select Division video disc system occurred on February 25, 1981. I was lucky enough to be the manager of the whole video disc situation from uh, one end to the other. Uh, national introduction occurred on February 25, 1981. Two assembly lines of video disc players started soon after in Plant 1. About 200 new employees were added. By mid-year of 1984, VCR prices had plunged. All video disc production was halted. All employees were laid off. Short-lived, very successful when it was working. In May of 1985, the first computer-controlled color TV final assembly line, which we named AIL-1 for automatic assembly line, <coughs> was, was developed by RCA personnel with the, our vendor, Harada Manufacturing Company of Kumamoto, Japan, input and assistance. Objectives were improving critical assembly accuracy, achieving color alignment consistency, which is not possible with the human eye, and reducing labor cost. In December of 1985, the sale of RCA to General Electric was announced. To many employees, this is one, this was seen as the beginning of the end, as GE had not been a successful competitor recently closing their large TV plant in Norfolk, Virginia. And their plant there was darn near the same size as our plant in uh, Bloomington. Uh, GE moved uh, all color television production to China. It was rumored that GE was only interested in obtaining national broadcasting company. In early 1986, the first automatic color TV assembly line, AIL-1, was installed and all of our objectives were achieved. In June of 1986, the sale of RCE to GE was finalized. On, May, on March 3, 1987, Bloomington began manufacturing small screen 15-inch GE TVs. This product was returned from Far East production. Rumors were this work was returned to the U.S. to pacify local and national complaints and there certain were a lot of local complaints that we heard in the Bloomington plant. In July of 1987, GE announced that it was selling their consumer electronics business to Thompson SA, confirming previous suspicions. Soon, Thompson Consumer Electronics was created. Thompson's plant in south of Paris, France, uh, was a small facility and was definitely not world-class. I didn't personally visit that plant, but we had other engineers and people there, and it, we could probably put two of their plants in this room. I mean, it, it was small business, small potatoes. <clears throat> 50 years to the day after the RCA television business, bro television broadcast at the World's Fair, a new technology called high-definition television was announced. In mid-1989, the third AIL line was installed in Plant 2, again with success in meeting all objectives. The three lines required an investment of $30 million, improvements in color TV picture quality and reduction of critical component assembly errors verified this investment was worthwhile. On October 8, 1990, plant population was 1,635 employees. The average age of the employees was 47 years, and the average years of employment were 24 years. At this time, there were 1,039 females and 596 males. Our production was going up, and our workforce was going down just a touch. 
because of automation and other reasons. On October 18, 1990, a great celebration occurred as the 50 million RCA color TV was produced. The plant was shut down so that all 1,635 employees and invited guests could gather in a large tent behind the plant as stated in the October 18th Herald, Time phone, Herald Telephone newspaper, its 50th anniversary celebration was as dramatic as its history, with invited guests that included national, state, and local dignitaries. Thompson's guest list reads like a who's who as well, with Chairman and Chief Executive Officer Bernard Saudier, uh, Lieutenant uh, Vice President of the Television Division for the Americas, Joe Clayton, and Lieutenant Governor Frank O'Bannon. Also, IU basketball coach Bob Knight. Uh, and, and country and western star Lee Greenwood. Ceremonies were opened by Lee Greenwood singing the national anthem. After brief opening remarks from invited uh, guests and Thompson officials, uh, 40, all guests and 40-year employees were given a commemorative remote control unit. They were asked to point at the gigantic revolving bro probe, robe, globe. <laughs> Our globe is not revolving, but just imagine that it is. Uh, point, uh, and then they were asked to punch the button on their tr trans transmitter to open the globe and the globe opened to reveal the 50 million color TV set. And if you won't share this with anybody, I'll give you a secret. I had the 50 million color TV set. <laughs> <laughs> uh, following the magic moment, uh, Lee Greenwood uh, delighted the audience with his hit, God Bless the USA. Also, Coach Knight offered all employees a rare opportunity to attend the IU afternoon basketball practice, which certainly was a big deal because most basketball practices were very, very secret. Uh, he announced that the plant would be closed if I would, uh, or he would open the practice if I would close the plant. I closed the plant for the rest of the day. At this time, the Bloomington facility was still considered the color television capital of the world. On the evening of the 18th, after the big day, a community open house was held and highly attended. Guests were guided by 40-year employees and management personnel. One TV assembly line was in operation. Many guests found this production line to be amazing and totally beyond their expectation or imagination. On the 19th, uh, which was the Friday the next day, the vendor tours were held. The plant was toured by 24 of our key suppliers and vendors that were a vital link to the production of our products. Guests were supported by the key Bloomington staff members. And on Saturday, October 20th, the celebration continued again for all employees. Outdoor games, plentiful food, and music were provided. The highlight of this celebration was the burying of a time capsule in the Plant 2 front lawn to be opened by the 2015 Thompson employees. I stated, in recognition of our conference for a successful future, we buried the time capsule today to be opened by 2015 Thompson employees. The best is yet to come and little did I know. In, in late October, production of 31-inch and 35-inch TV sets started in Bloomington. 225 jobs were added as a result of these new models and production projection TV production. On February 15, 1991, Mayor Tommy Allison and Representative Mark Cruzan announced plans for a truck route from West 3rd Street directly to RCA. The road would follow the path of the recently removed railroad tracks and the road would be named Patterson Drive after a highly respected city employee. An estimated completion date was not provided and I will tell you unfortunately the, the plant closed before the road was put in. <coughs> On August 10, 1991, it was announced that 
the 16.7 million 630,000 square foot finished goods distribution center being built behind plant two will truly be massive. As a comparison, it will be large enough to hold the college mall shopping center. The new distribution center will be dwarfed only by the 1.8 million square feet of space devoted to TV assembly. It's pretty darn big. At my initiative on September 6, 1991, Thompson donated 48 acres of land to the city of Bloomington for a community park. I wanted it to be RCA Park, but I, my people I reported to said it will be called Thompson Park. <clears throat> on October 30th, 1991, our quality leadership team called the Wild Five was chosen as the best quality leadership team in the United States, earning team members a trip to Paris, France for the World Quality Leadership Team competition. The team visited Paris in early December. Unfortunately, their excellent presentation was not chosen as the QLP World Champions. <clears throat> Excuse me. On January 6, 1992, the new 630,000 square foot distribution center named Park Hill opened, increasing the Bloomington facility to 2,019,000 square feet. Park Hill was the focal point of Thompson's product distribution system, system in the United States. In mid-1992, as a result of over $55 million being invested in facilities and automation, Bloomington was the largest and still mo and most automated color TV assembly plant in the world. With 1,800 employees, more than 3 million TVs pre being produced annually, with an average daily um, production amount of 15,000 TV sets. On November 23rd, we learned it takes more than an apartment fire to beat an RCA TV made in Bloomington. A consumer in Columbus, Ohio reported that his RCA model TV survived not only the fire and water to put out the fire, but the collapse of the ceiling onto the TV. He said it continues to work perform flawlessly. Another true testament to the quality of TV products produced in Bloomington. And I also received letters from two ladies working in Bloomington, one from a TV that had went through a, a tornado in uh, Bedford, and I can't remember all the details of the other one, but all three of those TV sets continued to operate. So <laughs> you, you guys were all doing a good job. <laughs> On November 23rd of 1992, oh, we've, been, we've been there. On February 5th and 23rd of 1993, two major achievements for 1992 were announced. 3,353,195 color TV sets were built. The old record was just a little over 3 million. Also, 10,000 full truckloads of TCE products equaling about 20 million items were shipped from the new Park Hill warehouse to distributors. On May 7, 1993, it was announced that Thompson achieved a $497 million gain in sales in 1992 after shifting its product emphasis to large screen TV sets in the RCA, ProScan, and GE brands. This rise in sales volume represented one of the largest year-to-year -year increases in the history of U.S. consumer electronics industry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sales of all RCA and GE brand products of TVs and video and audio products climbed to $2.9 billion, a 21% increase over 1992 production. On May 27, 1993, Thompson Community Park was dedicated with many civic leaders, Thompson officials, and about 30 neighborhood children present. In June of 1994, all employees were recalled and 107 new employees began work as two additional lines began night shift production to meet customer de demand. Also, 100 part-time employees started work. Excuse me. On 
September 27, 1995, the 65th, $65 million color TV set was produced in Bloomington. On November 17, 1995, the CE Horizons newsletter reported that after three straight record-setting years, the consumer electronics in in industry and TC along with it is suffering through a period of falling sales and price erosion. The early forecast for 1996 is for flat revenues and a significant loss of profits. On September 20, 1996, it was announced that Thompson suffered a worldwide loss of $202 million in consumer electronic sales. The sales fell 6.2%. RCA, GE, and ProScan TVs produced in Bloomington still led the U.S. in sales. We were getting it done, others weren't. <clears throat> On February 13, 1997, Thompson made a major announcement that it intended to close the Bloomington facility on April 1, 1998, moving all TV production to a new facility in Juarez, Mexico. Stating this action is due to the fiercely competitive and unprofitable environment of the U.S. television business. This announcement was a tremendous, tremendous shock to all Bloomington employees. There were many concerns and what if questions, and no additional information was provided. And Thompson actually closed the plant on March 25, 1998, no, just almost a year early as the last TV set came off the line. The closure marked the end of Bloomington's long history of 47 years and 10 months in consumer electronics production. At this time, the Bloomington facility was still producing more than 15,000 color TVs daily and was still known as the color television capital of the world. Who, I can't believe that the closing occurred, but it did. The dedication of uh, the employees did not change as they continued to produce good products, good products with high quality as the company transitioned from RCA to GE to Thompson and then to closure. In November, in, in late 1999, upon the sale of the Thompson facility and properties, the time capsule was removed from Plant 2 Lawn and relocated to Thompson, to Thompson Park. On November 10, 2009, I submitted a letter to the City of Bloomington Board of Parks Commissioners, President John Carter, requesting the name of Thompson Park be changed to RCA Community Park. On December 5, 2009, by unanimous vote of the Parks Commissioners, the name was changed to RCA Community Park and the road name was changed to RCA Park Drive. On October 15, 2015, the Herald Times devoted a front page article and picture to the history of RCA Bloomington. This is a, the time the plaque that went with the time capsule uh, that was just mentioned. On October 20th, 2015, the Times capsule was removed from its resting place and opened during a ceremony at RCA Community Park. Hundreds of ex-RCA employees and interested community members attended the time capsule opening. Contents were displayed and briefly discussed. During this event, a proclamation from Bloomington Mayor Mark Cruzan was read for all to hear. The proclamation stated <clears throat> that October 20th would be known as RCA Day in Bloomington in perpetuity. So remember October 20th this year. This function brought a sorrowful end to the RCA Bloomington story. In November 2015, uh, I donated the time capsule and many of its con contents to the Monroe County History Center, where they're on display at this time. And uh, there will be other items donated in the future, I'm sure. And I thank you very much for your attention and your work at our show. And uh, as I forgot, we have some RCA memorabilia that my assistant, who I call wife, 
Go ahead. truck, but the big ones look just like that. We pick up all of the member B type things that we can find wherever we happen to be and these are, these are some. We have a question. Yeah, was you the last plant manager or was there some after you? There were two after me. Yes. One year was plant, one year condition. Why I asked, my father's now deceased, but he went across the street and ripped the motor express on the other side of the tracks. Uh, and he saw them installed the air conditioning units by construction train while Fort London. I, I don't have the specific date when Plant One was uh, air conditioned. Pardon me? I said it was after 65 because I swept it. <laughs> so it was after 1965. How much after, we don't know. Don't look at that picture. <laughs> There's a list of plant managers. I guess there were three after me, not two, three. About a round of applause for Mr. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, Michael. Did, did morale go down noticeably when GD took over Thompson? Uh, yeah, yes, morale went down significantly when GE uh, took over the sale to GE. But, you know, it, people kept doing their job. They were just not happy and concerned with the future. And, uh, but the people met the task and continued to do an excellent job for us. But do you, do you think the quality started going down a little bit there? Absolutely not. Okay. We, we had a quality acceptance laboratory and you couldn't get things through there that were not built correctly. So I think we could, that's one reason we would continue to be considered the world leader in television production, and we were. Yes, ma'am. No one person could tag things. No solders and four solders and wires out. No one person could do it. You had to have somebody there driving and helping and everything else. And can I, I'll add a little bit to that story. Uh, we used to build our chassis that was the guts of the inside of the TV in plant one. And all of that work was moved to Mexico. And uh, this occurred right as I became plant manager. And we started getting chassis from Mexico. And uh, as we would you put them in TV sets, during going down the line, we had more and more TV sets fail. And uh, so we were having to pull off sets and repair them and slowing down production. And uh, I spoke to my manager in Indianapolis and said, we need to return all these rejects to Juarez so they can see what they are and fix them and learn from that. And he said to me, they don't know how. So it's a shame that when the upper management recognize the problem and wouldn't let us correct it. That's my only hang up with RCA. Any other questions? One more. 
About how many women worked in what, what you call the secret room, roughly? I don't. I don't know that number. I think it's a secret. It's a it's a, it's a secret. After all these years. If I recall, they, they wouldn't let, let you quit, right? Well, no, you had to try and get out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, or thank you all again. Thank you.